Good morning. We're going to begin today's business with general questions and the first question is from Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to make ferry travel more accessible. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government is committed to improving access to ferry travel. Operators of the Clyde and Hebrides and Northern Isles ferry contracts provide assistance, services and equipment to enable individuals with reduced mobility to access ferry services. Both continually review their service provisions to try and reduce the barriers to travel for people with reduced mobility. In 2014, the Ferries Accessibility Fund was set up to support improvements in accessibility. Uh, from four rounds of the fund, we have awarded around £338,000 towards a range of projects improving access accessibility across the network. Donald Cameron. Can I welcome uh, those developments? But the Minister will, we, will be aware of the widespread alarm which greeted one of the proposals in the Scottish Ferries Plan, namely to increase peak time ferry fares. A resident on Isla has told me that hiking fares on lifeline services will only serve to discourage people from living in our island communities. What assurances can the Minister give to people across the Highlands and Islands that they will not be impacted by such a proposal? And more specifically, how does such a proposal interrelate with RET? Minister. Well, clearly we recognise the concern that uh, ferry users of lifeline services have about accessibility to services when they, they need them. Uh, obviously, I really appreciate that in the region that uh, Mr Cameron represents that ferry services are vital for economic activity as well as for social uh, and other uh, health-related uh, uses. So we take such matters very seriously. Uh, I certainly would be happy to uh, meet with Mr Cameron to discuss his concerns about uh, issues that have been raised directly with him, uh, but happy to, to engage in that level. But we certainly are keen to reduce fares, as we've shown, with RET and to try and uh, introduce fairness across the network and make sure that anomalies and fares are, are addressed as well. And we certainly continue to undertake that on an ongoing basis. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister advise the Chamber what ferry, uh, car and passenger numbers were in 2007? Uh, what were those uh, corresponding numbers last year? And how much has the Scottish Government's introduction of road equivalent tariff helped uh, improve passenger access uh, in terms of affordability? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The number of cars carried by Carmack in 2007 was 1.06 million compared to 1.43 million in 2018. That's an increase of 34%. Passenger uh, figures in 2007 were 4.73 million compared with 5.27 million in 2018, an increase of 11.5%. We certainly very much welcome the growing uh, demand for ferry services and as, as reflected in the answer to Mr Cameron, we're keen to obviously maintain low fares as low as we can. Uh, this reflects the popularity of our islands, of course, the high growing demand uh, with tourists and the success of our policy to introduce RET. But in the three years since the full rollout of RET uh, in October 2015, passenger numbers across the Clyde and Hebrides services increased by 14% and car numbers increased by 25%, which shows the success of the policy. And we have commissioned a study to reassure uh, Mr Gibson and other members uh, that will estimate the impact of RET on demand for ferry services across the network. And this research will also help to identify the medium to long, effect, long term effects of RET uh, to inform future policy decisions. And we expect that to be completed by the end of 2019. Question number two, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on tendering the Northern Isles Ferry Services contract. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the invitation to tender for the next contract to run the Northern Isles Ferry Services was issued to three bidders on the 17th of January of this year. Submission of final tender bids is uh, scheduled for spring of this year, followed by the tender evaluation period with the contract due to start on the 31st of October 2019. Tavish Scott. Can I thank the Minister for that reply? When will the Minister be in a position to publish the specification for the tender, given no one in Orkney or Shetland knows what's in it yet? Does that tender specification have any improvements on the current contract? Uh, and will the Minister uh, make clear who the third company bidding is, as we well know that Serco and indeed the Minister's own choice, Calmac, are already two out of the three companies? Minister. Um, we are committed to fair, open and transparent tender, which aims to get the best deal for the communities that depend on the ferry services uh, serving Mr Scott's constituents and, and others in the Northern Isles. It is important that the identity of the bidders remains confidential at the stage in the procurement procedure and we will be discussing the procurement procedure with bidders in the coming weeks following which uh, we intend to publish the ITT on the Transport Scotland website and I'll make sure that Mr Scott is aware uh, when that is published. 
Uh, we will also review whether it would be appropriate to identify the individual bidders at that point for the clarity that uh, Mr Scott is seeking. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the points about the improvements to the service, I, I should say that we have, um, uh, after extensive consultation with stakeholders, including hopefully elected members such as uh, Mr Scott, and Mr MacArthur and others, um, we have sought out to try and produce as much flexibility in the new contract to allow variations in services and timetables uh, to be undertaken with greater ease than under the current contract. And I hope that is something that um, those representatives the community served by the services will welcome. And Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Will the Scottish Government ensure that, that vessels on the Northern Ireland's ferry services contract are covered by collective bargaining agreements with the maritime unions? Will this be part of the specifications for the contract? Minister. I, in terms of the point that Mr Smith recognised, I recognise very much the point he's making and about in trying to ensure that we have fair working practices in the all procurement contracts that the Scottish Government is associated with and certainly assure uh, Mr Smith that we are strongly encouraging through the uh, ITT uh, good engagement with trade unions and other stakeholders and I will happily, uh, as soon as I am able to give detail to Mr Smith about what is specifically in the ITT uh, on those issues, hope that will be of help to him. Question number three, Mark Roskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how commuters' views inform ScotRail timetabling changes. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Ahead of the December 2018 timetable change, ScotRail consulted with local authorities and regional transport partnerships who represent passengers' interests throughout the timetable development process. ScotRail has also adopted a new approach to the May 2019 timetable change by publishing its proposals and inviting customers to comment. We are not aware of this level of consultation being undertaken by any other UK train operating company. ScotRail has already made changes to its proposals as a result of responses received from its website, social media and from correspondence. And ScotRail will also observe how customers are using the current timetable. Mark Ruskell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I mean, notwithstanding the national uh, discussions that took place with passenger groups, there was really zero consultation with commuters using the Dunblane to Edinburgh services, which led to the withdrawal of the only service that would actually take people to Edinburgh in time for the start of the working day. So what influence can the Cabinet Secretary bring to the May timetable in light of the public consultation so that it actually serves the needs of commuters? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, there was an extensive consultation that was undertaken since 2015 in preparation for the timetable changes uh, in December 2018, and that also included a, uh, an independent assessment of the proposed changes being undertaken uh, by uh, TACTRANS in looking at the impact it would have on passengers and customers using these particular uh, services. And as a result, the, uh, although there were some who were negatively affected by the timetable changes, uh, the vast majority of those uh, would benefit from the timetable change. As ever with any timetable change, there is a weighing up of the pros and cons that go with this. Uh, an independent report uh, verified that the choice that was made for the timetable change was one which would benefit a greater number of uh, the travelling public. However, what will happen going forward is that ScotRail will review the existing timetable as it beds down to consider where there are further changes that can be made <coughs> in order to try and improve uh, uh, issues where there are uh, matters of concern. However, there will always be a level of restriction and capacity on the network to be able to accommodate all passengers' needs. Angus Macdonald, to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thanks, uh, President Officer. Further to the Cabinet Secretary's response, he will be aware of inquiries I have made to his office regarding the removal of a direct train service between Pomond and Stirling on the Dunblane route, and he will also be aware there is a similar issue for commuters in Linlithgow. Does he agree with me that ScotRail should reconsider these changes implemented in December, which are affecting many of my constituents, and that consideration should be given to reinstating direct services to Stirling from Pomond and Linlithgow as a matter of priority? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I stated, President Officer, my earlier response uh, to Mr Ruskell is that there is limited capacity within the network and there is always a balance that needs to be struck in terms of any timetabling arrangements. But if it's of interest to remember, uh, of the 1.2 million journeys made from Linlithgow and Pomont last year, these were split. Uh, broadly, 70% were to or from Edinburgh, 20% to or from uh, Glasgow, with 5% to or from uh, Falkirk or Stirling. And given the need to make sure that we try to address issues such as overcrowding, improve connectivity, faster journey times, 
and also to deal with the growth that we have on the use of our rail network. There's a need to try and strike a balance and trying to get a, a timetable uh, that meets the, uh, the widest number of passengers' needs as possible. And that's what the intentions were with the timetable change on the 9th of December. But I am aware of the concerns that the members raised as uh, there is the issues that were raised by Mr Ruskell. Uh, and of course, these are matters that will continue to be considered by ScotRail uh, for any future timetable changes within the limitations of what can be achieved within the network. Liam Kerr, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will know of the timetabling changes which resulted in an up to 30 minute wait at Montrose. Surely, if the Scottish Government cared about North East commuters' views, it would have improved facilities and sort their views before making those changes. So, did it seek commuters' views in the North East, and when will those facilities be improved? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, obviously the member conveniently ignores the fact that we're investing some £300 million in the rail network in the north-east of Scotland to improve connectivity within that particular area. And we've also seen a significant increase in the number of services which are available now within the north-east of Scotland as well. However, on the point which the member raised, uh, there was a consultation undertaken, as I said, for the timetable change in 2018, uh, which involved a whole range of uh, regional transport partnerships, including those within the north-east of uh, Scotland. And as the member will be aware, ScotRail are presently evaluating the improvements that they want to make to the Montrose uh, station and that that work is planned to be scheduled and taken forward in due course. And Jackie Bailey. As part of the timetable changes, my area was promised that there would be six carriage trains, particularly at rush hours. Yet in the months since, commuters have experienced short form services with three carriages appearing instead of six and passengers crammed in like sardines. I know that there is no limit on the number of passengers that ScotRail tried to squeeze on their trains. But can the Cabinet Secretary tell me whether there is anything in the contract with ScotRail about the capacity of the service? Cabinet Secretary. Epstein officer, the member will be aware that we are making significant investment in order to upgrade the rolling stock we have within the ScotRail franchise, which is result resulting in some uh, 70 new Hitachi trains uh, being introduced into the network in order to provide overall a 23% increase in seating capacity across the network. Part of the challenge in some of the routes has been the late delivery and supply of the Hitachi trains and also the refurbished HST uh, high-speed trains, which are having an impact on the cascade of the rest of the uh, rolling stock across the rest of the network. Once we have all the additional uh, rolling stock in place, that will allow us to make sure that we maximise uh, the use of the rolling stock to address areas where there are, and I recognise there are areas where there is congestion uh, which, uh, and overcrowding on some trains, uh, which is unacceptable uh, and is a matter which is addressed within the franchise, but we need to get the additional rolling stock in place in order to address these matters, and that will be taken forward in the months ahead when it actually supply the rest of the trains which are due to have provided by now. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed congestion on the M8 between the St James's Interchange and Glasgow City Centre with Transport Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Transport Scotland, as an agency of the Scottish Government, discusses operational matters relating to the Scottish Motorway and Trunk Road Network with ministers on a regular basis. The M8 between Paisley and Glasgow is the busiest stretch in the country, and Renfrewshire businesses are warning us that congestion is deterring investment. Last week, all parties voted for an amendment stating that the Glasgow Airport Access Project, which I remind the Cabinet Secretary is a tram train project, must be progressed urgently. The SNP scrapped Garrow in 2009. Ten years on, people don't want any more delays, reports, studies or excuses. They just want you to get on with it. When will the SNP deliver the rail link they voted for last week? And if they won't, will he explain to businesses and people in my region why on earth not? Cabinet Secretary. Oh. Officer, the motorway link at the west and the a M8 is a, a key link to uh, the airport and also to the rest of the west of Scotland and it's an area where we are aware of the congestion which has been caused there and need to make sure that that's addressed. That's an issue which will be addressed within STPR2 uh, and I've asked officials to make sure that it's given priority. Uh, the member will also be aware that the uh, Glasgow Airport Access Project team uh, which is led by Glasgow City Council and Renfrewshire Council have been reviewing the evidence uh, that was presented to it on the independent audit uh, of the outline business case for the tram train link to Glasgow Airport. 
Uh, they've identified that there's a number of issues which are outstanding with that that causes real challenges in being able to deliver such a project. Uh, they've now identified that their preferred option is a personal rapid transit service which will be provided. And that's a matter which is now the preferred option and will be presented to the Glasgow City Regional Deal Cabinet in the coming weeks to consider in taking forward the outline business case for that proposal. Question number five, Joanne Lamond. <coughs> With a degree of optimism, to ask the Scottish Government <laughs> when work will begin on the Glasgow Airport Access Project and how it will ensure it is delivered as outlined in the business case. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Glasgow Airport Access Project is one of the projects identified in the Glasgow City Region deal and is being taken forward by Glasgow City and Renfrewshire Councils. As such, responsibility for the delivery of the project to improve surface access to the airport sits with those councils. The Scottish Government remains committed to working with partners to find solutions to improve surface access to Glasgow Airport. As part of that commitment, I chaired the Glasgow Airport Access Executive Steering Group yesterday. At this meeting, the group heard how the project team have considered issues raised in the independent audit of the project's outlined business case. I was pleased to hear that Glasgow City Region Deal has recognised current and future rail service issues which would comp be compromised as a result of their outlined business case. And as such, they are now seeking to take forward a preferred option, which is for a personalised rapid transit option. And that outlined business case will be developed by the partners. Joanne Lamond. I can't tell the Cabinet Secretary how utterly dismayed I am by the response he has just given us. He may be pleased. This Parliament, including the Minister himself, voted last week yep. for urgent progress yep. on the deal and plan as outlined in the business case. I don't know what he defines as urgent. What he has said now is not urgent. So I can ask the Cabinet Secretary, who is it that is putting a block on a proposal where the money is there, the plan is agreed by the partners, yeah. it is recognised as having social, economic and environmental benefits to Glasgow and the west of Scotland, and it's still not going to happen. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit himself to act on the position he voted for last week in the interest of the people of Glasgow and the west of Scotland, change this decision and make sure he goes back to the proposal that did have agreement unanimously by the the City Deal Partners. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we have acted on it. As I mentioned, the meeting yesterday set out that it's going to take forward a business case for a, a PRT system. Uh, as a member will be aware, the outline business case had an independent audit of it carried out, which highlighted a number of very significant issues, in particular constraints at Glasgow Central and the potential impact that that would have on services to Inverclyde, Ayrshire, and also to East Kilbride, all of which would have actually saw a reduction or a detrimental impact on their service. And also, it would have been preventing the enhancements we intend to provide to these particular services. Therefore, because these issues could not be addressed through the outline business case, that's why the City Deal Partners have identified a PRT system as their preferred option, and they now intend to take that forward. Jamie Green. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, the first feasibility study for this was done when I was 10 years of age, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Passenger numbers are set to double in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, the number of people working on site is set to increase to around 40,000. It is simply inconceivable that this can be achieved relying solely on the M8, which is already heavily congested. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary think that the rail link realistically will be built any time soon? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, in terms of uh, two points the member raises, one in terms of the M8, and I recognise the congestion issues there are on the M8 uh, to, the, uh, to the, the west of Glasgow, and that's an issue which has to be addressed. That will be taken forward through STPR2, and I've asked that to be a matter which is given uh, priority consideration. Uh, but I'd be interested in knowing the member's views as to whether he'd be content with the idea of a tram train link uh, going into uh, Glasgow Airport that would result in a reduction in services to his constituents in Inverclyde or to constituents in Ayrshire 
or to constituents who are in East Kilbride because of the limited capacity that is at Glasgow Central. We have to take a whole system approach to this yeah. in order to address these issues, not to look at them in isolation. And that's exactly what we've been doing and working with the partners around improving surface access to Glasgow Airport. And as has been recognised now, that's why they will now take forward the idea of a PRT as a preferred option in order to improve connectivity at the airport. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that my constituents in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency will be shocked and also disappointed to hear that the Labour Party are campaigning to actually have a worse service as a consequence of this Glasgow Access Rail, rail, rail Link? Well, Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the reality is that there is, a, there is limited capacity. There is limited capacity at... OK, order, please. Order. Let's, let's hear the Cabinet Secretary. Let's hear the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Senator Officer, there is limited capacity on the line uh, from Paisley Gilmore Street into Central Station. And even with enhancements, that would still result in a detriment to services to places such as Inverclyde, to Ayrshire and also to East Kilbride, and potentially also to the Shots line as well. And there is also significant enhancements planned for these particular routes, given demand that there is on these existing routes. And that's why the Outland Business Case and the Independent Audit has identified these issues that need to be addressed. And that's why they are now proposing to take through a PRT option, which is one which will improve connectivity to the airport, while at the same time allowing us to increase capacity for these other key areas where there's ever-growing demand for rail services.